<laughs> okay, meetings in order. Let's have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Commissioners, let's have a roll call. Norm. Commissioner Pascal Jordan. Here. Commissioner Driscoll. Here. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, Commissioner Cohen called in. Her staff called and indicated she was ill and would not be joining us today. Uh, Commissioner Macris. Yes. Commissioner Myberger. Here. Commissioner Stansberry. Present. Commissioner Wright. Present. The quorum is present. Thank you. Members of the public shall have the opportunity to address the retirement board on items of interest to the public that with, are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the retirement board, including all the items that are considered today. Members of the public may address the retirement board for up to two minutes and will be informed when there is 30 seconds remaining for their allocated time. Public speakers using translation assistance will be allowed to testify for twice the amount of the public testimony time limit. The President of the Retirement Board may limit the total testimony to 60 minutes. So if you're speaking now the first time, we will not allow you to come back and speak again. Try to speak every, you know, talk about everything you need to talk about at one time. Is that? No. So, oh, okay. So we, they can come back again? Right. We would urge that they make their public comment after the item is called and after the board okay. has had a chance to engage in the discussion and that we'll call for public comment prior to the board members' vote on okay, each good. item, good. including the first item. Okay, we realize that many individuals here today are here for item number one, consideration of level one or level two engagement, and public comment will be taken before any board action on that item. You may wish to hold your comments on item one until public comment is taken specifically on that item. Okay. We have a list of uh, speakers for general public comment, which is in front of you. Before we get to that, we have two microphones, one on this side of the room, Tony, one microphone on that side of the room. Bob. Item one. And I will recuse myself. Do we have general Do we have okay, general? general public comment on first that comment <laughs> originally. The general public comment list in front of you. Seen, uh, yeah, there's a list. Oh, there's oh a list. the list of. Is there anyone who wishes to speak yeah. under general public comment? There's a list. Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, yeah. not related to item one? Just general. Just general. general. Okay, this is not related to item one then. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Buck Baggett. I'm a member of San Francisco East. Um, I'm sure I, first of all, how many people are here for the San Francisco A site? You Wells Fargo folks should raise your hands. You think of it as the Wells Fargo A. Show raise your hand. Um, first of all, thanks for finally putting it on the agenda. And we think it's outrageous. After we requested a larger room last time, and told you that we would bring more people than would fit, that public employees, retirees, and members of the public are standing outside in the hallway. Do you recall us asking for a larger room? We do what we say we're going to do. A lot of people care about this. I do have one question, though. What are you trying to hide? What are you trying to hide? This has been the most difficult border commission for me to deal with and for us to deal with, and I've been here since 1976. I've been on boards and commissions. If you're not trying to hide something, you've got me fooled. And one way to show that you're not is be to let the people that are standing outside come in. Some of them might even be Wells Fargo employees here on paid time. We asked you to give our people room. And for those of you that are here to testify in support of Wells Fargo, especially people like Annie, are you aware of the fact that Wells Fargo pled no contest to the Department of Justice charges for doing ghetto lending, charging blacks and Latinos higher fees and higher interest rates 30 seconds. for their loans? We invite everyone to get money from Wells Fargo. In fact, we hope they give more away in the community. But those of you that are here to speak in support of them might want to think a little more broadly next time, because we don't use the word lightly, and 
I don't especially as a white guy. They're predatory and racist lenders, not simply discriminatory. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, hard to read that name. Yeah, the thing is, is this the public or item one? This is the general. Yeah, yeah this is the general. general. Okay. So, Number two. Uh, it's really hard to read in this name, but it's stand. Okay. Oh, Number I one. know, Stardust. <laughs> I am Stardust with the Occupy the Auctions and Evictions Mike, campaign. Please. Mike, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Stardust with the Occupy the Auctions and Evictions campaign. Um, I again want to urge the San Francisco Employee Retirement System commissioners to do their fiduciary duty in protecting the investments. Uh, of our pension holders here in San Francisco by uh, examining the investments in predatory, discriminatory, and uh, in banks involved in predatory, discriminatory, and illegal lending. Uh, I hope you will follow your own social investment policy, which clearly states that uh, discriminatory lending uh, should be considered uh, as part of the investments of the retirement fund. Um, you have uh, received a lot of information from staff about the uh, various illegal, discriminatory, and predatory activities of the banks, but you probably haven't received the latest one, which was just announced on April 4th. The Department of Justice, de uh, and, and I'm sorry, <coughs> I actually can't see with the goggles. <laughs> um, it says here, Reuters, members of the U.S. military whose homes were unlawfully foreclosed on between 2006 and 2010 will receive about $39 million from subsidiaries of Bank of America and Morgan Stanley, the U.S. Department of Justice announced on April 4th. Um, and they also said that they're continuing to do audits of the country's five largest mortgage servicers, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Ally, to identify violations of the Service Members Act foreclosure provisions that occurred between January 1st, 2006 and April 4th, 2012. So this is not over. The banks are continuing to engage in these illegal, discriminatory, predatory practices, and we ask you to take action in, in, in the interest of people in this room who are themselves facing foreclosure and evictions, who are your own uh, retirement board members, um, or sorry, who are your own city employee members of the retirement system. Thank you. Okay, it looks like uh, number two through six have been crossed off. So number seven, Steve? Who's yeah, right here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Steve Zeltzer. I'm with United Public Workers for Action. I'm also a retired city employee. And frankly, I find it outrageous that our pension money is going to a criminal bank. Yeah that has been illegally stealing homes from working people in San Francisco and around the country. That's what they've been doing. They're thieves who That's should be right. prosecuted Damn right. by the people of San Francisco in this country. And unfortunately, they give money to the politicians who aren't calling for their prosecution. Eric Holder has said they're too big to nail these hmm. banks. I say they stole our money, they stole our tax dollars, they engaged in illegal activities, and they continue to engage in, in illegal activities. And the trustees board has a responsibility to say no more money to the Wall Street banks who are stealing our money. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. That's where, they, where we stand as city employees. All the city unions who represent the majority of city workers in San Francisco are calling for you to take action, to respond to the city employees who put their money <coughs> into the pension fund. I don't want my money in Wells Fargo Bank. I know people who've been thrown out of their homes, who are guarding their homes now from these banks, which have been illegally seized. And not only that, the title companies illegally outsourced uh, the uh, titles to China and India in order to save money to monopolize the, the title industry. They've illegally taken, they don't have the documents and they're telling people to leave their homes. This is illegal under California law. I think we need a real investigation of the banks and a real prosecution of the criminals and the gangsters who really run these banks. And that's who they are. They're gangsters master, master, uh, masquerading as legitimate people. That's right. If you or I and a city worker engaged in the practice mm -hmm. that they did, we would be in jail. That's right. right. They'd arrest yeah. us and put it away. But Hello. since we're a banker, we get special rights. We get special rights in this country. I think it's wrong. 30 seconds. I think it's wrong, and I think it's time that we, the people and the pension 
interest, the people who are getting pensions because they put money in the banks, say enough is enough, these bankers need to be held responsible and accountable, and we don't want our money in these banks, and we don't want these executives getting a dime more from us. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. I don't believe there's anybody left on the list for general pub public comment. <coughs> okay. I will then call item one, and at this point I will recuse myself from this item and um, pass the gavel on to Commissioner Driscoll. Why are you recusing yourself? She does not need this favor. Well, why not? Because I do own a bank stock. Ah, okay. Which stock? <laughs> you don't have to engage. No, I mean, I'm, I'm a member of the pension. I would like to know which bank you own. I don't Can't you say which stock? It's okay, Steve. I, I really don't. Recusals? It's okay, Steve. No, I'd like to know what bank you have stock. I, I really don't have to make that comment. On it's a private stock thing. Are there any yeah. this, this hey, it private doesn't private even private mean it's any wait, any wait, bank yeah. here. I, I do own a bank stock. You own bank stock. A but wait, bank stock. Not this bank. Wells Fargo. Another bank. Let's move along. Yeah. Any other refusals? Okay. Excuse you. Uh, we need. Is there the, any? The president of the of the board is conducting the meeting, and there will be a call from the president of the board or the acting president of the board if there are any other refusals. And we would ask that, as you have shown in the past, that you respect the process, and that you re, you know you. you preserve the right to be heard. I'm and conflicting so myself out of this vote, so I will leave, and I think that's the fair thing to do, and any other commissioner who has that same conflict should do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to make a statement. I'm Brenda Wright, and I was appointed to this board by Mayor Willie Brown, and we appointed by Mayor Gavin Newsom as a private citizen, not as an employee of Wells Fargo Bank. I work for Wells Fargo. Please, folks. Please, folks. Let's be calm. I work for Wells Fargo, so we'll be recusing myself from this. Hey. Thank you. But I also wanted to to note that I am personally offended by the fact that you took personal actions against me up to and including threatening to protest my home. So I would want to let you know that I believe that as you have your rights, I have my rights, and I believe that you have infringed upon my right to serve as a private citizen. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair uh, I don't believe I have a conflict, but I believe I have a disclosure issue I'd like to make. Uh, I have an acquisition of $11,000 worth of Bank of America securities. I don't believe that that dollar amount, whatever decision comes out today, will materially affect my investment or will materially affect Bank of America's profits or losses. Uh, therefore, I will proceed and sit in the meeting. Thank you. Board members. <clears throat> okay, folks, we'll start with item one. After the board discusses, there will be a motion. We will then open up to public comment on item one again. Uh, this meeting's a little bit unusual, so if I make a parliamentary mistake, our parliamentarian will stop me. Also, Mr. Norm Nickens will assist, because we want you all a chance to feel you had a chance to speak and give us your views on any one of these subjects. Item one. This item was added to the agenda at the request of Commissioner Myberger. Um, he is also drafted the two alternative motions that were embedded in the uh, item. I won't go through the item other than to say that we again, as we will always do when we're considering the social investment policy, we'll focus the board on those issues that will make the investment in these banks or these types of companies riskier or considerably riskier than a, a normal investment, and we focus on the investment side, the investment risk, 
the industry risk, and that's why we wrote the item the way it was written. Uh, we, as a staff, do not have a recommendation as to whether the board should or should not engage these banks, any number of these banks, under the policy because that is under the policy of the sole discretion and authority of the retirement board. And with that, uh, Commissioner Myberger is the one who had proposed the two alternative motions, uh, so I will turn the floor over to Commissioner Myberger. Uh, thank you very much. Excuse me a second. Yes. You don't run the meeting. Okay. I know you're trying to help. I was going to do the same thing in terms of recognizing Mr. Myberger because this is his motion, so he will be answering all the questions, not staff. Okay. Okay. No, thank you, Jay. I just want to make sure it's clear. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Myberg, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for calendaring this. Um, as long as possible for the folks out there. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, I appreciate it being calendared, um, Jay, as well as uh, from uh, uh, Commissioner Pascal Jordan. Uh, this is an uphill battle. I'm sure you understand this. Uh, let me put a few issues on the table in terms of why I am, have put this forward. Uh, number one is we are fiduciaries. Everyone at this table, uh, the four remaining members, we are fiduciaries. We are here to manage the assets for the exclusive benefit of the members and their beneficiaries. And to me, it's obvious when, and this, is, this uh, dovetails on uh, Mr. Zeltzer's comments, that when a company pays a fine, in the case of Wells Fargo, $175 million, in the case of the banks, billions, $7.3 billion, and a lot of fines, that hurts the value of our investment. These fines detract from the value of our investments. It is as simple as that. Um, it, I believe it parallels Sarbanes-Oxley as a result of 2002, where the heads of the companies had to take responsibility for their subordinates, which is why level one is on the table. Level one has to do with the chairmen of the board holding the simultaneous positions of CEO, chief executive officer, and a member of the board typically the chairman of the board. Just as an example, we have several different banks here, and, and at the uh, suggestion of the executive director, it's been brought into all of the banks that have fallen under the, um, that have um, been cited by the attorneys general, et cetera, in terms of those that have engaged or allegedly engaged with illegal, predatory, and racially targeted investments. This is wrong. I mean, this is not complicated. This is wrong. I mean, it's pretty easy. People would try to make it complicated, but this is wrong. Sarbanes-Oxley says that the heads of the company have to sign off on the financial statements. To me, this is the same thing. If we're subordinates, if we are, if we are the managers and our subordinates do illegal activities, there should be some dealing with that, particularly to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, Stardust mentioned that here you have people that are, that are, that are in service for the country away there, and then they're losing their houses to foreclosures, and laws have to be passed to, to cure that. This is wrong. It should be done. The banks are not going to act in your self-interest because they're beneficent. Okay? Sorry. That's just not what the banks are. But to me, the issue turns on the fact that these are illegal activities done by these investment by these banks. There has been no penalties for that, other than financial penalties, there's been no uh, activities based on the uh, people that run the show. And that's what level one is all about. Level one has to do, the short answer is too, it's too powerful. The, the heads of these companies have too much power. CEO and chairman of the board. Jay Hewish is our executive director. Should we make him the president of the board? Oh, come on. I mean, that's too much power in one person's hand. How can you be objective in that case? And on that subject, the level one says we want, we want to vote in favor of resolutions that call for the separation of the chair and chief executive officer, which is our policy. This is not new. This is our policy, and I've asked, I've asked staff on several different occasions to provide details on how we have voted in the past on that. But I want the positions separate. And it's not just chairman of the board, it's any position on that board. This is wrong. It's too much power in people's hands. And in addition, to the CEO, Chairman of the Board, Jamie Dimon is also a member of the Federal Reserve Board. This is wrong. Is this a conflict of interest? 
here yeah. you saw a member of the board had to recuse herself for something that to me in my eyes is less significant than having CEO, chairman of the board, and a member of the Federal Reserve Board. This is wrong. We have to take the power away from you. The, uh, that's number one. Number two is um, specifically against these people, the heads of these boards that serve as CEOs and members of the board. That we are, we hold proxies. Collectively, this pension fund owns about one uh, three hundredths of Wells Fargo Bank, JP Morgan, and these bank stocks. One, roughly 30 basis points, three tenths of 1% of all the shares outstanding. We want to vote our shares and send a message that this is wrong. San Francisco is not the only fund. And let me read to you an email that was sent, and I provided this to uh, staff as well. This is from CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System, $250 billion in assets, approximately 2% of the shares of these banks, 2% of the shares that are voting this way as well. Let me read your message. This is from Joe Deere. It was an email that I just summarized, but I, it says, again, Joe Deere is the chief investment officer, and uh, he says the following. I can assure you that CalPERS will vote to separate the CEO and board chair roles at Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, and every other company that persists in adhering to that poor governance practice. CalPERS will also continue to follow developments in the mortgage markets, including bank compliance with settlement agreements and further opportunities to advance public policies that redress the harm suffered by homeowners. CalPERS. Okay. This is CalPERS. And that is copied to Henry Jones, the president of CalPERS Board of Administration, and Rob Fechner, the president of CalPERS Board of Investment. Okay, this is not. This is coming from a very, very high level. Other public funds have similar policies. It's too much power in one person's hand. It is. That's what level one is all about. There's two other ones. Uh, point three is to vote in favor of resolutions that seek additional disclosure and or reform of mortgage lending practices. And number four is to vote no on executive compensation advisory resolutions. So that's level one. Okay. Level two has to deal with more, what I would call engagement. And I heard uh, Mr. Zeltzer talk about divestment, that is selling the shares. Let me be absolutely clear, I am not in favor of divestment here, period. This is level one, which is voting our proxies. Level two is engagement. Level three is selling the shares, uh, selling the shares. I'm not saying we should sell those shares. We would be absolutely clear. I am not in favor of selling those shares. I'm in favor of an engagement with these companies to obey the law. Mm. Is that complicated? Yeah. To me, that's quite simple. That's really the substance of this. Number one, again, this is level two. Level one is you take all actions under level one. Number two is to call on these banks, okay, we generalize this, to broaden it to all banks, not to number one, stop predatory and discriminatory lending practices. It's not asking for much, is it? Number two, to implement and disclose policies and practices to prevent recurrence of predatory and discriminatory lending. This is what policy boards are all about. Okay? Stop it. Don't do it anymore. Number three, and this is a controversial one, number three is to grant affordable permanent loan modifications to all borrower, borrowers who request them and who are entitled to such by the settlement with the estate's attorney general. Okay? They have to ask and they have to be entitled to them. Okay? We're not giving away the farm on this. They have to ask and they have to be entitled. That's all it is. Okay? It's not just give them money or give them a, uh, uh, anything else. Number three is to call on other institutional investors to join these actions. Again, similar as CalPERS, CalSTRS, and the other ones, as long term passive investors. And number four is to safeguard the risks which contribute to the volatility in the markets. Okay? That is the substance of the resolutions. Okay? <coughs> While it may seem, obviously, it's generating a lot of controversy, um, but that's what it's all about. Notice, and let me continue with um, the first black in the White House. Okay? We're talking about discrimination, racially targeted. I want to begin with, I want to continue with the quote from the first black in the White House. It wasn't Obama, so you know. It was uh, Frederick Douglass who said, power 
concedes nothing without a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. We are up against a tremendously powerful group of, uh, of people, the banks. Okay? I'm sure many of the board members perhaps have been solicited by various players here, urging them to vote against this. Perhaps, just a wild guess, Mr. Lazarus, just a wild guess. <laughs> The banks are very powerful. There's a lot of power behind it. There's a lot of money. Can I make it any simpler? The banks make money. That's what they do. And they do it well. That's what they do. So there's a lot of power. There's a lot of influence. There's a lot of money behind this. That's why this is a very, very challenging kind of thing we're up against. Power concedes nothing without a demand. These are very, very powerful people. Okay. Does Mr. Okay, part of it, let me uh, finish, then I'll open it up. Voting against the compensation, the compensation, is the head of Wells Fargo Bank or any other bank entitled to make $18 million a year? Is he entitled for a 10% raise over last year when overseeing on his watch this happened? No. And if our executive director or anyone else did illegal, illegal activity, I would want that dealt with. And that's what I'm asking for here. <coughs> The banks have settled. There are allegations, and I think substantive allegations. They are allegations, you know, they are, they're substantive. But come on, are you gonna write a check for 175 billion or nine billion if there was something behind that? Now oh, come on. What I'm asking for today is, is simple. Number one is level one, which is the policy, voting against separation of the CEO position from the chair from the board position, okay, which is um, coincident with our policy. Our policy says we should do this. So this is not seeking out banks only. This is consistent with our broad policy in terms of the separation of powers. Okay. Which made, this is good governance. This is what Mr. Deere was saying about following good governance. Okay, this is what it's all about. So those are my, those are the, the reasons why I've challenged this. I appreciate, I know many of you have come here several different times to voice this. Thank you for your attention on this. And I think we owe it to our members, not just those that are here, but to all the members who are ethical, who want to receive their, their pensions based on, on, um, on legal activities. Let me also say that it's a challenge. Okay, I know this is not an easy thing to do. I'm sure there's a lot of power. I'm sure there's a lot of other things that want you not to do this. But it's very, very important. And I think it's important in terms of dealing with, with these issues. There have to be policy changes. Uh, those are my views on that. Um, I'm prepared to make a motion, but I think as a courtesy, I'd like to hear the viewpoints of other board members uh, on this issue. I speak, I think we should take public comment so we can hear. Our motion, our rule is after a motion is made, public and oh, board is finished speaking, board comment. I'm <coughs> also looking forward to the board, or members of the public speaking. Okay. Uh, as to uh, addressing Mr. Myberger's comments or the policies he's talking about, there's a lot, of, said a lot. Uh, as for clarifications about policy, there's references to our policies. Some of those points perhaps should be clarified so the public doesn't walk away thinking that's how the policies work, let alone other statements about their benefits are based on the charter, not on our investments. Correct. I think that's true. In case anybody was wondering what that statement by Mr. Meibriger meant, uh, the cost of the benefits as a function of how our investments do. Okay. Uh, if there's no other comments, uh, I'll re-recognize. I, I will. I'll, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'm sorry. I'll make a, I'll make a statement. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for your time and for being involved. This is the most people that I've ever seen up at the retirement board since I've been here. It's, Grand, it's, a, it's a pretty short stint. Um, five years ago, the financial markets took a, a turn for the worse, and the financial health of our pension system was called into question. Uh, today, the story couldn't be different. We're back at near 
pre-crash highs in the financial health of our pension system looks good. Of course, the future is always highly uncertain, but things look better than they did five years ago. Our job as trustees is to protect and safeguard our pension system and the investments of our pension system, which pay your retiree benefits and those benefits of people who will someday rely on us for their financial security. Um, what we try to do is minimize risk while maximizing returns. And investment risk can come in many forms. It comes in the form of business practices that our investments engage in. And those business practices can be risky and they can make an investment a poor investment. As a trustee, uh, I'm very concerned about those business practices and any illegal business practices that would jeopardize the financial health of our pension system, retiree benefits, and the future <coughs> of this system. For many people in this room, and just in general uh, society, I know that our financial health is pretty closely tied to our monthly mortgage payments. And for most people, buying a home is generally the largest financial decision that any of us will ever make. But it's also an emotional decision. So for those of you who have had to go through foreclosure, I, I can only imagine the frustration of what that's like. I know I get frustrated when I just have to call my car insurance company just to file a simple claim. So I imagine you take that and you multiply it by 100 and it's a whole different level of frustration. Um, to prevent this cycle from reoccurring and happening again and for things for the foreclosure process to happen all over again, real change needs to be affected. And the only real way to do that is through the legislative process. So for those of you who in this room have been in dialogue with the Board of Supervisors, your officials in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., I encourage you to continue down that road. I know some local politicians have taken an interest in this whole market cycle. Uh, but in the meantime, as our legislative bodies sort through this and figure out what's gonna happen, we as trustees, as a board, will continue to closely monitor the financial health of our system and all the investments that are in it and their business practices. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, oh, go ahead. A motion to engage in level one and level two uh, is made. I will not support it, colleagues. Uh, if it fails, I will put a motion forward for us not to engage. So it will be a, a statement from us. First, we have a proxy policy in place that covers most of engagement number one. Also believe it's bad to call out particular companies or industries uh, as a body when we're talking about the investment. And that's pretty much why we have our proxy guidelines so we can set a path of prudent investing and responding to all of these things. The resolution calls out three banks. If we're going to do something, we do it to all of the banks. I mean, it got to be collective. So that in itself is just a wrong way to do it. Uh, there is no doubt that what happened over the years is pretty shoddy. And I think it falls under underwriting quite a bit. You qualify someone at 2% and then a year later it goes up to 4% and a year later it goes up to 6 your payments doubling the first year and then going up another third. I mean, most people can't make that payment. But That's right. I believe there's responsibility on the bank side on underwriting that and not writing it at a real interest rate. So they made a bad deal. But also, the person signing that note has some responsibility to themselves that they also know they can or cannot make that payment. And when you borrow money, there's two sides to the equation. I mean, maybe the banks have money, but the money is our money. It is a form of savings. And the bank has two ends of the bookends, as they say, on responsibility. Safeguarding the person that puts it in in a, in a uh, passbook account and safeguarding it on the other end. And obviously, we're hearing the one end but uh, for me, I understand that the person that puts it in as a savings account is driven by the bank doing the right thing to protect their savings account. The 
regulations that have been imposed after 2008 uh, collapse is pretty, pretty regulated. Uh, I don't think I want to sit here as a shareholder of a company and tell them a better way to come up with a new disclosure form or a new form of regulation. And I think uh, my colleague is correct that you deal with that legislatively and it's done smart and all the players uh, will sit at the table. So if there's a motion to go forward, I will speak against it and then I'm prepared for the motion not to seek level one or not to seek level two. Okay, thank you, Victor. Um, Let's see. Um, I think this is the third or fourth meeting where many of you have come to speak on this subject. Uh, if the room is uncomfortable or not cool enough for you, uh, I suppose I could apologize for that, but it's too late to mean anything today. Um, secondly, this issue, not that I'm trying to give you a, any kind of a lesson about what we do here on the board with our policies, with our investment decisions, with our voting on proxies. A huge part of the relief I think some of you were speaking about in the past when you explained to us the very serious foreclosures you're facing, very, very difficult getting ready to lose your houses in a number of forms. I want to say most of this stuff or none of this stuff really will affect that. Uh, not that the bank has to listen to us. We do own a number of shares with the banks. But I don't, whether we vote yes or no, the solution you may be looking for, whether it's personally or against the problems with lending in the housing industry, actually we're concerned about lending literally around the world because we do invest around the world and we work on both sides, meaning we invest for equity, we lend to all sorts of buyers of businesses and operators of business. That these motions really are not going to solve that problem. We're very concerned about the credit cycle. It has affected the whole economic recovery of the last several years. It is just one of the major reasons why the recovery has been as slow as it is. There are a lot of good news the last couple of weeks and months, but still there is a huge forward problem going in all of the markets, in all the countries that we invest in. So I'm not trying to take you off the focus of you're trying to save your home or your friend's home or a fellow worker's home, but there is very little, I think actually nothing that these motions do. One particular issue I'm very up on is the issue of splitting the CEO and chairman of the board roles. We have policy to address that on a specific case-by-case -case basis. I'm not I've not seen actually a case made why we should split this role, though generally I am for that. I had exposure to some, with some other professors recently who spoke very much about that very subject. There are some very poorly run companies, very poorly run companies where they have that in place and it's very difficult to change them. And sometimes simply selling, divesting is not a smart option or sometimes you can't get out. There's no buyers for what your interest is. But without a motion on the floor to address whatever is going to come out of Mr. Myberger's writing. Um, so the long-term solutions for this has to do with things that Attorney General Kamala Harris and her peers around the country have done along with the federal government as well as different bodies of legislatures. I am very familiar with the Sarbanes-Oxley law that passed. One of the downsides of that, though people claim it has improved things, actually it has increased the cost of business operations which has made a lot of work for a lot of people, but some people have said it has negatively impacted returns. What's that about returns if the companies run better? Every one of these moves has a good aspect to it and a negative aspect affecting what we do. Anyway, I'll stop going round and round about this issue. And if Mr. Mybury wants to take the floor and try to create some sort of a motion so we can continue discussion, motivate, and invite the public in. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear the public's comments. As as no, I'd like to hear I've told, the rule is that there has to be a motion first. before there's public comment. I'm not prepared to make a motion. So we're not going to get the comments? I will make a motion that we uh, not engage in level one or level two. Okay. Uh, I will make a motion that we not engage in level one Motion has been made to not engage in level one or level two. Is there a second? like a foregone conclusion. Look over and see. Could we hear you, please? 
I'll will, he has a right to say something. I don't necessarily have to look at it. Okay. I will second the motion for the purposes of discussion. You have the floor, Mr. Mackers. My comments speak for themselves. You've already made your comments. Ready okay. for other comment from my colleagues, and I'll open it up for the members of the public to share their views. Okay. Mr. Meyerberger, would you like to speak again? Um, <coughs> tell me the process. I would speak to the, floor, then the, the members of the public. Members. After the board is finished, coming, we'll invite public comment. Yeah. Um, I want to speak against the motion. Um, when you do something wrong, there must be remorse, or it's going to happen again. This is not complicated. For those of you who support the motion, show me some remorse. Simple as that. How do we know this will not continue? How do we know this is not going to continue? The other issue, again, the rem and this is this is not complicated. This is not. We haven't seen any remorse by. We haven't seen any firings of these people from these banks that, that have made these illegal, racially targeted, predatory loans. They've been called out. Maybe they're still, maybe they got raises. I don't know. But we have to, and this is a policy making board, I think we have to say very simply, this is wrong. And that's really what the motion is all about. This is wrong. Because yes. If there is no remorse, it will happen again. Okay? We talked about the legislation aspect. Well, obviously the legislation is important. Has it cured everything? Okay? If, if legislation is the avenue, then I don't think anyone would be here. It would be done. So the short answer is yes, I'm sure that was well-meaning, but the legislative aspect has not worked. And that's why we have to try something else. San Francisco has a reputation as being on the forefront of policy. Uh, San Francisco is the uh, first city to recognize Cuba. Uh, San Francisco is the first to have an emperor, uh, Emperor Norton. San Francisco is at, has been at the forefront of policy changes. If this fails here, I don't see any hope whatsoever, frankly, in changing these kinds of things. I really don't see anything in terms of changing. I think we have to send a message that simply this is wrong. How do you say this is wrong? I don't see any simpler way. I mean, I, I think it's important. And let me also add, again, fiduciaries. I, and as fiduciaries, we have the, op the, the mandate to maximize the returns. If there's illegal activity, I don't think that is maximizing the returns. If you pay fines, Clearly, that is indicative of you're not maximizing the returns. So I think, in terms of our fiduciary aspect, that that is an important issue that we must manage the assets um, to maximize the returns. And I think people like ethical companies, don't you? I mean, I think we want to do that. And I, I, I think that's the key issue. And one last comment. Um, as you know, I've been involved in the social policy forefront. I champion the cause uh, for uh, tobacco investment. Uh, which incidentally was not unanimous. So, uh, uh, it's a challenge. I mean, it really, really is a challenge, but I think we have to say this is wrong. The reason why I, I championed cost for tobacco divestment was this. A lot of the members don't like to get their earnings from companies that are killing people. They put it Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that was divestment. Okay, that's level three, divestment. So I, I think that is a similar kind of thing that many of the members don't like to receive dividends and earnings and capital appreciation and other kinds of uh, returns associated with illegal activity. This is wrong. The board must take steps to change that policy. We must solicit remorse. And I see many people from Wells Fargo, uh, perhaps in other banks, maybe that are in the audience, tell me remorse. I'd be glad to hear a remorse on this. Tell me, give me the assurance that this will not happen again. Very simple. Try asking that. So anyway, those, those are my final comments. Say anything? Uh, before we call the public, it's, uh, we're supposed to make all our comments. <coughs> Mr. 
Mr. Myberger links it to several other policies. And there is, we can always argue, therefore, what is, how are we fulfilling fiduciary duty when we're trying to minimize risk and maximize return in a safe way? So certain policies, for example, the tobacco policy, we have lost a certain amount of money with that policy change. That's unfortunate. I don't particularly like smoking, even though I have to make a living eating smoke, so to speak. But that loss, that small financial loss, had to be made up by somebody. It was made up mainly by the city of San Francisco itself, but now because of the new fee sharing or contribution sharing by the city employees and the sharing, the active city employees will also pay a small piece of that <coughs> small loss. So every one of these policies, if it leads to divestment, has an effect. As for the issue of remorse, I guess one of the facts that sometimes we expect staff when they do research on any of these social investment policies is these issues of the allegations and whatever caused any of the banks to sign an agreement and pay a fine or a settlement or redo their work. It's a very complicated lawsuit, but what does settlement really mean? Does it mean they were guilty of what they were accused of, or did they make a business reason to just settle it and move on? It's always one of those arguments about settlement. I know the city often recommends the city go into settlements for that very reason, just to end the case. There's no judgment of guilt. If there's no guilt, why should people want to do remorse? Perhaps more importantly, it's not that remorse is worthless, but the in a sense, one of the other items that Commissioner Myberg has spoke for, to, but so did Mr. Stansbury, about going forward, will there be change, will there be improvement so people know they can buy homes safely, they can stay in their homes safely, they can make other plans, since people use the equity in their homes to do many things, to include retire, putting their children through college, a whole host of reasons. It's their asset that they run their life around. So again, uh, in terms of voting, for the level one and level two, I do not see where the case has been made that any of these banks are guilty of items that we need to tell them to change. I think the banks have already started the change long before this came. Why did they do that? Banks have their own reasons for running a intelligent, fair operations. They have their own reasons why they want to be a sustainable entity. But as for this issue of how this motion that is before us, voting no on level one and level two, yes, I am prepared to vote on that. There's no further comments. We're going to open up to public comment. May just quickly uh, be a little more specific in my, my answer. I know some people thought I gave a little bit of a generic response. Uh, in terms of level three, I, like Commissioner Myberger, do not support divestment. Um, if at some point the investment became these investments were risky and it was detrimental to our system or there's some other extreme extenuating circumstances and I think we can revisit that. Um, level two, I don't view the retirement system as a political body. I view the Board of Supervisors as a political body. They make resolutions that affect things not just here in this city but outside the city and around the world. And I view our task as very specific. It is to invest city employees money so that when they retire that they have a secure retirement. In terms of level one, um, there are parts of level one that I that I like and I agree with. I think that certainly a separation of power is, is an important thing, especially in terms of governance. Um, it's a check and balance, much like our government. But in terms of seeking additional resolutions and additional disclosure, um, the government's already been working on that. There are settlements with the Attorney General. There's going to be resulting changes that come from that. A again, it goes back to what I said about Level 2. I want us to be very specific and targeted in what we do, and it's an investment of your money, and not just your money, the other 50-odd, some thousand people that are in the retirement system, and that we do it in a way that maximizes our return without pushing the political envelope. That's what politicians are for. We are here to guarantee the financial security of this trust. So for those of you who I think were wondering sort of where I stood on it, I wanted to be specific. Yeah, I think. 
I forgot to recognize that we did get information from people who tell us not to do this for that very reason. They think we, we are not investing wisely by simply going level one or divesting. Okay. I'm not trying to speak for those thousands of people who do not want us to get involved in this. Okay. With that, uh, the motion has been on the floor. The board members have spoke. We shall open up to public comment. And again, I remember the rules. Try to refrain your, relimit your comments to two minutes. We have numbers. I will call out numbers. Please speak. Number one. Do you remember how you signed up on this list? And if you don't remember your number, you have to go by name. We we're supposed to refrain from saying names for for confidentiality reasons. We're trying to respect your right to maintain your identity. Okay, number one is Joe, excuse me, any of my pronunciations, Joe O'Hagan? O'Hagan. O'Hagan, thank you. Well, Commissioners, my name is Joe O'Hagan, and I'm the Senior Vice President with Wells Fargo Health Mortgage, the servicing area directly responsible for community outreach. Could we please respect? I welcome the opportunity to be here today and really share the facts about our home preservation activities here in the city of San Francisco, the state of California, and nationwide. And I encourage you to vote down the resolution at the 40 basis on those facts. You already heard some of the inaccurate information around our foreclosure activity, around our home preservation activity throughout the state. So let me start by, by settling the re setting the record straight from here. Wells Fargo has more than 25,000 mortgage customers in the city of San Francisco. 98% of those customers are either current on their mortgage or only uh, past due by one payment. From January 2009 through February 2013, we either completed or started to work out on 1,650 customers. 75% of those were loan modifications where we restructured the mortgage and created greater affordability for those customers. And about 23% of those customers were which uh, we did a short sale transaction or deal of foreclosure, again, to avoid foreclosure. But over that same four-year period, we had or completed 530 foreclosure sales. And to show you how that number really fits in with some of the numbers that you may have received before, if as has been claimed that there have been 12,000 foreclosure sales here in the city of San Francisco between 2008 and 2011, well, as far as responsible for, for, for less than 5% of those sales. That's a remarkably low percentage when you consider the fact that over the last 10 years, 30 seconds, we funded 17% 7, of all mortgage loans made in the city. Let, let, let me also speak about the loan modifications nationwide. Since 2009, we completed 844,000 loan modifications. Included in those restructuring is $6.4 billion of principal forgiveness. The majority of that has taken place right here in, in the city, or in the state of California. So with that, I'll, uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Han. Number two, Brad Blackwell. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you for uh, having us here today. Uh, my name is Brad Blackwell. I am an executive vice president, and for uh, the past decade, I've been in charge of uh, national origination for Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. Uh, currently, I'm in the role of uh, portfolio lending manager. And here's what I can tell you. You heard Joe's discussion of the, um, of the results. Wells Fargo has the lowest delinquency and foreclosure rate of any lender, any major lender in America. And that holds here in San Francisco. The reason for that has to do, one, one major reason has to do with our, in 2004, was, we were still in the, what you might call the go-go days. And Wells Fargo made a decision to issue a set of responsible lending principles and exit some of the very common practices or never enter into the common practices that were going on in the industry. One is the uh, stated income subprime loan. Uh, Wells Fargo did not do those loans. Uh, that has led to uh, better performance by our uh, customers. Second was the monthly adjustable negatively amortizing arms that were originated and you've read so much about. Wells Fargo did not do those. As such, we lost lots and lots of market share during that period of 2005 through 2008. Um, but we did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. Now, with a lot of allegations about uh, Wells Fargo being a discriminatory lender, I can tell you that um, first place, here in San Francisco, we have 85 people dedicated to home lending in this state, in, in the city. 
every one of them is is passionate about home ownership and sustainable home ownership. And by the way, more than 50% of our team members and originators are ethnically diverse, so, uh, as am I. 30 seconds. Um, and then, uh, as such, because after that period uh, occurred, Wells Fargo became the number one lender in the city of San Francisco. Last year, we were 21% uh, share of the, of the uh, city's market providing homes and, uh, and financing for those people, uh, for the people of, of our city. Second is that um, uh, we were even greater market share for ethnic minority uh, home buyers. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to outreach. You're going to hear from some of the some of our team members soon. Finally, thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Time. No, can I address I, uh, the no. Time. Sorry, Mr. Blackwell. Number three, Alfredo Pedroian. Good afternoon, and thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to address you here today. My name is Alfredo Pedrosa. I'm a native San Franciscan, and I do government relations for Wells Fargo. Um, I also, um, like Commissioner Brenda Wright, was targeted by Occupy and ACE um, at my personal home um, because of my relationship and my, my job here at Wells Fargo. But I want to be here to tell you the true story of Wells Fargo's involvement in the San Francisco community. As you know, Wells Fargo is a national company with deep roots in California and a strong commitment to the city and county of San Francisco. Our company has been based in the city since 1852 and 3,100 of our team members are proud to call the city home and live in every single neighborhood in the city. We also have nearly 9,000 team members working in San Francisco and 41 bank stores in the city. In 2012, Wells Fargo team members volunteered more than 50,000 hours in support of schools and nonprofit organizations. Wells Fargo takes pride in the positive work we do in our hometown and across the country. What we do in communities matters and makes a positive impact. Here are some of the highlights of how Wells Fargo makes San Francisco stronger. Team members from the Bay Area personally donated 12 million to schools and nonprofits. San Francisco team members donated more than 4.6 million. Over the past three years, we donated more than 60 million to Bay Area schools and nonprofits. More than 30 million was donated to organizations based in San seconds. Francisco. We made, uh, last year we committed a million dollars to the campaign for San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center and we're the largest contributor to the Friends of the San Francisco Public Libraries uh, building renovations in low-income communities. Last year, we donated 50000 to Mayor Ed Lee's San Francisco Summer Jobs Program, creating jobs and paid internship for low-income uh, low youth. And we also participated in creating affordable housing for um, veterans here in San Francisco in partnership with Sword Supply Share and the Town CDC. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Richard. <coughs> Number four, Miguel. Miguel. Miguel? I'll get one of these names right. Yeah. That's right. Sorry, Miguel. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Miguel Buscos. And I'm a native San Franciscan, born and raised in the Mission District. I'm a proud product of the Mission. I'm also a member of the board. I mean, a member of the service employees. Uh, that you, the investment that you um, that you hold. I work for the city very proudly. Um, I'm in charge of the community outreach for Northern California, and it's my job to work with community groups with faith-based organizations, government officials, to help people stay in their homes. Now, I gotta tell you, believe it or not, we go way out of our way to try to reach everybody. Talk to us early and often, okay? Because we're here to help. We have, we have home preservation workshops. We've been involved in over 1,100 of our activities throughout California. You know, we hear a lot of people saying that, you know, we don't work with people. There are a lot of people on the Wells 52 that we have worked with. In some cases, we gave them an interest rate of 2%. I would love 2% loan, right? But it wasn't enough. 14, 12 out of the 14, I mean 12 out of the list have recently completed modifications. 10 have completed foreclosure sales. 24 are delinquent. Some, four of them are on active workout plans. Four were previously reviewed. Sixteen were reviewed and denied because of documentations. Six received modifications but then defaulted. Twelve are equity home. Three of those lists are not even Wells Fargo loans. So I just got to say that, you know what, we are Wells Fargo. We are this city. We are these communities that we represent day in and day out. Really? Yeah, really. 
<laughs> respect on me, not 30 seconds. Have respect, okay? All right? Okay, so look, we're here to help. But it works both ways, and we want to do that, okay? Sit down and speak with us. Excuse me. So, anyway, Let me interrupt the speaker. As I, saying, as I was saying, look, we go out of our way to try to help people. We have events, we have home preservation centers where we invite people to come in. We are Wells Fargo. We are our communities, and we care about the places that we live and we work. Thank you.